Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to announce first that uh, we do not have a board meeting next week. It is town meeting week, and we are taking our uh, board meeting time off. I encourage everyone to vote in their town meeting and elsewhere. Um, I'll also just remind any folks who are new to the um, meeting today and haven't been here before, just as a reminder, or maybe to some of the old folks, uh, to sign in up front. There is a sign-in sheet up there. And then last, our March schedule is available and posted on our website. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to Abigail. That's all I have to report. Super. Next item are the minutes of Wednesday, February 19th. Is there a motion? Second. We moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 19th. A lot of the additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. At this point, we're going to turn it over to Patrick and the hospital, uh, the health system finance team for a discussion on fiscal year 19 year end. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, fellow board members and members of the public. As the board chair just said, we are here to represent some of the summary points of financial activity for the 14 Vermont community hospitals for fiscal year 2019. Uh, before we begin, we want to make a couple of notes to the board and the people in the audience around a few of the hospitals who reported or did not report for some of this data. So Springfield, given some of the circumstances down there, let us know ahead of time that they were not going to be able to report on our timeline. So the information in here is not audited, it is preliminary, and it is unaudited. We've done our best to caveat that throughout the entire report, so please keep that in mind. Uh, second note is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital submitted their narrative and uh, leadership and board chair oaths on Monday, and due to the tardiness of that, we have not included it in this report. The uh, deadline was January 31st for all hospitals as put forth in the uh, budget order, effective 10 1 2019. Um, and more importantly, is North Country Hospital submitted their financial information and their oaths did not submit their narrative. So we don't have any detail from their mouth of what occurred in 2019. And that's important because in the budget order, effective 10-1-2019, the board ordered that North Country will submit reports <clears throat> accurately and timely. And we wanted to make a note that um, that was not fulfilled for this um, reporting uh, for fiscal year and 2019. Um, so with that on note, we will move forward. This is an overview of what we're going to discuss today. The first three bullet points on here are what this team will discuss. The appendices is supporting and further information. Uh, this slide here is a um, brief reminder of requirements, expectations, and amendments that occurred in fiscal year 2019 um, for all hospitals. And the amended budget orders are the three you see on the screen. And at the very bottom is that caveat regarding Springfield's financial information that you will see throughout this report. Oh, okay. So we've also updated this recently as of a few hours ago that Northeastern also had a, an amended budget order and we will make sure that that is posted to our website. <clears throat> this is a summary assessment of hospital identified themes and drivers of revenue both up and down and main drivers of operating expenses um, throughout the hospitals in Vermont. A lot of these are common themes that are known to the people in this room who are following uh, the healthcare situation in Vermont and they are um, not unique to just 2019. <clears throat> um, for example, the electronic health record um, puts the implementation of these projects is not only costly, but we've seen delays on several uh, levels within hospitals that is causing pressures on revenue. <clears throat> With that, we'll move into our system profile. Um, here on slide six, <clears throat> this is the beginning of the profile, the actual NPR FPP revenue fell short of system-wide budgeted revenues by 0.8%, while actual, actual operating expenses surpassed budget by 
year-to-year -year actual growth of 2.9% in NPR FPP fell short of the target set by the Green Mountain Care Board of 3.2%, while operating expenses grew year-to-year, -year, fiscal year 18 to 19, 4.9%, which equates to a 2% variance in revenue to operating expense growth. The overall results at the bottom of the screen indicate operating expense growth outpacing revenue, causing a reduction in operating margins system-wide. As of fiscal year end 2019, the system-wide operating margin was only 0.7%, totaling $21.1 million. To put this in context of dollars, actual NPR FPP generated by all 14 hospitals totaled $2.589 billion, and what they walked away with collectively was $21.1 million on operations. The next few slides are going to go into further detail on this summary slide here. This is slide seven, and it reinforces the revenue variances for dollars and percentage change perspectives, as does this slide for operating expenses. And the main focal point here is that UVM Medical Center really does drive those bottom line figures there with the budget to actual variance and actual to actual variance of both revenues and operating expenses for the system. <clears throat> Fiscal year 2019 is the third consecutive year that system-wide NPR MPP growth target set forth in the budget guidance by the Green Mountain Care Board has not been met, with the 2019 target being lower from prior years down to 3.2%. So we're seeing a trend now where the total system is not able to reach the growth target set by the Green Mountain Care Board. So this next slide, we're starting to um, expand a little the themes that we pulled out of the narratives, what the hospitals were reporting to us. So this slide here is talking about payer mix and revenues. Um, several of the hospitals reported to us that they are shifting from commercial to Medicare. Um, we've done a system-wide analysis that's up on the screen right now that shows the three payers over a four-year period of time. And this does partly demonstrate that trend. Um, but as with any system-wide analysis that we do, it's heavily weighted towards some of the, towards the largest institution in the system. So when you break that down to an entity level, there are about five hospitals that show decreases in their commercial, increases in their Medicare. Um, and so for those hospitals, that's a, that is a significant change for them. Another way of looking at changes in revenues, payer mix, and um, looking at gross revenues versus net revenues, Several of the hospitals reported to us that they had actually met their gross revenue target and even exceeded it by one point, I think it says three percent, I can't see from here, one point three percent on a system-wide level, meaning that they they hit their gross targets, but they did not hit their NPR targets. On a system, as Patrick already went over, we are at a minus 0.8% budget variance for NPR. And so what that means is that what happens between gross and net, those deductions grew. Um, for FY19 compared to budget. And another way of looking at this is the chart below, which is NPR, FPP as a percentage of gross revenues. So basically, what percentage of your, gro of your gross revenues was actually made into NPR? And it was pretty stable for about four years from FY15 to FY18, but we see a drop in FY19. Um, it went from 47.3% to 46. 1%, which are relatively small numbers, but to put that into context, that's about $238 million, um, a change from FY18 to FY19 in that deductions category. And just to remind you, deductions are things like bad debt, free care, reserves, contractual allowances. Um, so that was a trend that we wanted to bring to your attention. <coughs> cool. And we'll note with that, that even though there has been consistency by mapping this out, we are seeing this reduction and we are going to be looking further at this moving forward um, because if this does become a trend in the years ahead, we're going to want to know why it's occurring. <clears throat> Slide 11 puts into a dollar's perspective, operating expenses outpacing operating revenues, uh, keeping in mind that operating revenues 
do consist of revenues that are not related directly to patient care. This is where the 340B specialty pharmacy, pharmacy type revenues come into play. <clears throat> um, however, you can see that their growth is what's keeping, um, trying to keep up with the operating expenses. Um, the impact on the margin <clears throat> is being influenced by this subsidization and some hospitals are making efforts to grow their other operating revenues to catch up with the fact that MPR is not quite getting to their budget goals. <clears throat> we'll talk more about this in slides ahead. So operating margin, this gives you a dollar's perspective and it highlights what we are seeing in our system as of fiscal year end 2019. Um, we're seeing some consistency with the hospitals who are performing positively, but the larger note here is the hospitals who are not posting positive gains. We're seeing consistency or growing losses um, on those operating margins. And it shows that circumstances can shift year to year very rapidly and highlights the current fickle financial state of our hospital system. And this is the operating margin percentage look, um, as opposed to the dollars percentage or the dollars uh, perspective that you saw previous to this, with a standard five-year average. <clears throat> and from some hospitals, that average continues to grow deeper and deeper in the red. Total margin it really begins to show the picture of the hospital system as hospitals begin to have a bleed from operating margins into total margins. And what I mean by that is the operating margins are becoming deeper and deeper and the unreliable revenues being generated from non-operating funds is not enough to cover that operating loss. Um, for example, um, investments in reserves need to be mined to cover the shortfalls and as they do so, they are reducing their balances. And those reserves and investments are also um, at the whim of market forces. And as those change, um, we could see even deeper numbers on here should that occur. Um, there's also matters like contributions that go into this. And of course, depending on who gives what and when, there are several factors as to why that could rise or fall. So the operating margins are beginning to bleed over the total margins and we're beginning to see more red on this screen if you want to highlight that for um, fiscal year 2019. <clears throat> so Patrick just spoke a little bit about the under operating revenue and um, the part that it plays in operating margin. And so we wanted to kind of give you a more detailed look of that other, opera other operating revenue component. Um, as operating margins continue to deteriorate and programs, including the 340B program, become less predictable, the hospital's ability to rely on other operating revenue is also challenged. Several hospitals, as we know, we heard in our FY20 um, budget this summer that several of the hospitals um, attribute the funds from the 340B program as being critical to the sustainability of the organizations and even when as far as to say it keeps their doors open. So we as staff, as when we look at that and we look at the other operating revenue and the reliance on this, we want to keep an eye on this. Um, to sort of demonstrate the growth in other operating revenue, the chart below, the purple is NPR FPP and stacked on top of that is the green, the other operating revenue, which is you know, a small part of it, but an increasing part of it. Um, so you can see the orange line is the growth of of other operating revenue as a percentage of total operating revenue. It's grown from 5.4% all the way up to 8.1% um, in this last fiscal year. And then the next chart shows an even bigger blow up of other operating revenue, um, showing that same time period of 2014 to 2019, how uh, other operating re revenue has grown. It grew substantially between last year and this year, um, increasing by more than 83% since 2014. And then sort of to remind everybody what goes into other operating revenue, we talk about the 340B program, but there is a lot in there. Um, and the chart on the right shows the different categories 
over a three-year period. We didn't include the dollar value on these because it became a very messy chart, but to see how those um, categories are growing and shrinking over time. And as those programs um, or revenue sources become less reliable, so too is the liability on the ability to have a positive operating margin or at least meeting budgeted operating margins as a result of other operating revenue. So sort of transitioning from revenues, from a revenue look to an expense look and flushing out some of these themes that are really hitting us over the head this year, um, workforce and um, drugs are were cited by most hospitals as being the drivers of their operating expense budgets. And um, we really wanted to put in this report some reference to the cost of contract labor. Um, because of the way that adaptive, the adaptive software is set up, we cannot pull that information out of adaptive, um, the operating expense that's attributed to the contract staffing. But we did have um, the Rural Health Services Task Force report that we could reference. And so you've seen this information before. Robin was the chair of that task force. Um, you've seen this information before, but it, it, it takes into consideration 11 out of 15 hospitals, 15 because Brattleboro Retreat is included. And it shows over the course of four years how um, the millions of dollars that are being spent on contract labor. So this is for nurses and for MDs. And it's grown from 26.4 million in FY15 to 52 million in FY18. We knew that the FY18 numbers were even a low estimate. And our understanding is that this number will be much higher in FY19. Um, several of the hospitals reported this to us in their narrative, in a narrative form, in a sentence, not with a dollar value attached to it, but we do that, know that that number is growing. And then we also wanted to let you know what is um, a driver of performance in some of these hospitals, and that would be the leadership turn turnover. We noted that in 2019 there was nine CEOs and CFO positions that changed. We counted four of them were CEOs and five were CFOs. In 2000, this is amazing because since 2017, the only one that has not changed is basically Southwestern. In fiscal year 2020, just recently, we're seeing a possible three CEO changeover and six CFO changeover. Some of that includes, of course, uh, Springfield's changing over their interims and things like that. Um, and then before we move away from this expense slide, just kind of a comment on um, the drug component. Again, our adaptive software doesn't really give us a great way of pulling out the, the, the drug costs, um, but we do hear from the hospitals that the main drivers of that are new drugs to market. And for those hospitals that have an oncology department, the cost of those oncology, those cancer drugs, is very, they're very expensive. So those are, those are coming up over and over again um, as the hospitals report to us. For the um, actual, actual growth, looking at the system, the system is below the target that the Green Mountain Care Board established back in 2018. It was 2.9%. Um, excuse me, it grew 2.9%, but the growth target was 3.2%. And um, nine of the hospitals did not reach that maximum growth. So this slide is a prompt for beginning the enforcement discussion. This slide is a prompt for beginning the enforcement discussion for this year should the board choose to take any action. It should also serve as a prompt for the NPRFPP targeted growth for fiscal year 2021 as we continue our work in the budget guidance for the coming year. This reinforces the budget to actual NPRFPP results of each hospital for enforcement discussions, which will begin at our meeting on March 18th, 2020. So we've covered a lot of information here very quickly across the system, and we want to pause for the board if they have any comments to make. Comments from the board? That was a great question. Go ahead. I just want to go back to the slide, let's see, 16, um, with specialty pharmacy, seeing that there's a large growth in specialty pharmacy as a source of other operating revenue. We also, of course, have you and you just said there's increasing drug costs. So I'm wondering, is there a sense of what the margin is on that? 
No, and that specialty pharmacy category is UVM. They are the ones that use that category. So if you have further questions about that, we would at least know who to ask. Okay. <laughs> Great, and I just wanted to comment on the total margin is what worries I me. Mean, there's a lot about this so far that is very worrisome, but you know, if you look back at 2017, we had one hospital in the red on total margin. And you go back, this is on slide 14. Right, in 2018, we had three hospitals in the red on total margin, and now we're at six hospitals in the red on total margin, and four of them are on a declining path. So this, this slide in particular stands out to me as one of the most troubling. I didn't know we're on, we're not even there yet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and a couple comments as well. Uh, if you could go back to the Vermont Hospital System chart. Very beginning. Um, page six, I can't see it. You know, the, the part here that I really want to point out, um, which is also, you know, is alarming with the where the total margin is going, right? Which is or total dollars at twenty one million. But one of the things that I really look at is the, you know, the 18 to 19 actual growth, the 2.9 for the NPR, the 4.9 for the operating expenses, and, and then looking at the budget to actual variance. And um, for operating expenses, it was 3% higher than we done a minus 0.8 on the top of it. And 3% is $75 million, right? It's about $25 million for each percent, um, rough, or maybe a little bit less than that, because expenses are a little more, 2.7 million. Um, and the point there is, if you look at that $21 million where we ended up in operating profit, right, $75 million has been taken away because of the higher expenses to budget and the 2% higher, you know, over prior year. So it's very alarming where things are going. Um, the, the biggest issue is the top line going down and the bottom line uh, and the operating expenses going up, which is, you know, something we've really been trying to address with each of the hospitals, particularly as they miss their top line numbers and they can't adjust their expenses quickly enough. And, you know, then to kind of skip ahead to the to slide, uh, to slide 19, where we really look at all of the hospitals, 10 of the 14 hospitals that were missing their NPR numbers, right? Some very significantly. So the worry there is that that then carries into 2020 because many of them built their budgets off of you know, their budget 2019, they go to 2020, you know, so we really, you know, when we do talk about enforcement, I worry more about the hospitals on the, the negative side than those that were up above. And that was, you know, a big contributor for what's happening with the operating you know, margin itself. Um, going back to slide, Going back to slide 10, you know, this was another area where, you know, that decline of the 47.3 to 46.1 percent. I, I do want to just point out one thing just because of the sound bites. Mm -hmm. I know we said it's, it's like about, it, there, there was $280 million more in deductions. Mm -hmm. A large part of that is because there was higher top line and we get deductions of 50% of those, right? So, you know, that's going to be about 240 million of that is, is just because we have a higher top line, we, have, we only get 50% of that. But that 1.2% um, change right there on gross, net to gross, right? When Rose is like double net, so it's it's like five billion. You know, is about a fifty million dollar hit as well. So I think it's you know, and 
we know part of that is the bad debt and the free care, and part of that is going to be some higher reserves that were taken. You know, but those are, to me, the, the two biggest things hitting the bottom line, right, are the gross to net and deductions. And some of it's payer mix, clearly. Um, but it's the bad debt, the free, the deductions, and then the higher expenses. So um, I know we're going to go into hospital by hospital, but I, I do think it is pretty dramatic you know, what we've seen in, in the changes for bottom line. Um, and the other chart um, page, uh, oh, you the other operating, so page 16. Just want to comment, I mean, I love this chart as far as like, you know, over on the right side, really being able to drive into the other operating revenue pieces. And I know we talked a little bit about, you know, other operating is revenues relatively small compared to you know, total NPR. And it would be great to be able to really dial into, you know, the changes in NPR in a format like this and the changes in expenses in a format like this. Because I think it really highlights you know, the changes year over year. And the other part of this piece, you know, I've been tagging on to what um, Jess was bringing up. It would be also interesting if we could ever correlate the, the expenses that go with this. Because there are, you know, there are expenses, and when we look at, wow, we went up from 174 to 227 million, so 50 million more in other operating revenue. Why doesn't that all drop to the bottom line, you know, at some point to, to correlate that? Maybe, maybe questions for the hospitals, but, um, you know, overall, I think you guys did a great job of summarizing all of the changes that went on, and now I know we'll kind of dive deeper into each of the hospitals. Um, thank you. Anyone else from the board? <coughs> so I'm uh, looking at slide 10. And just a question on that um, little chart in the upper left-hand corner, um, looking at Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial. Um, do you have any insight as to whether or not, for example, the Medicare increase is being driven by demographics or changes in uh, um, you know, payer, you know, payer payments? And similarly for the Medicaid folks, is there a demographic element there or could some of this be cost shift? That's our understanding is um, that it was primarily driven from demographics but we did not do that analysis it's coming from the areas of the hospitals just another comment on that and I, I know we have talked I, I, you and I have talked a little bit about this when we actually dive into the hospitals right we'll see some hospitals where that shift is um, more dramatic away from commercial and other hospitals where commercial I think possibly at UVM right is, is higher is going up so not only you know not only is it as a system but within each hospital and that can have a huge impact on that gross to net when you assume you know that commercial is going to be about 70 80 percent gross to net and uh, medicaid is going to be about 30 or 35 and medicare about 45 so you know, we could be swinging 20 points uh, for every every move so i think it's when we get into the individual hospitals it's important to Look at that a little bit. So my next more observation is on slide 12. And uh, if you kind of just look at uh, UVM and that medical center and the system-wide totals, the system-wide totals for uh, operating margin over the five-year period is 329 million if you, if you add those. And um, the amount that accrues to the UVM Medical Center is 295 million, or 89.9 percent of all the operating margin uh, flows in that direction. And I, you know, I just think that um, you know, you know, as we look at hospitals, some things are clearly um, uh, tied to the individual hospital, but some things might be tied to more structural elements across the entire system. And my sense is that. Uh, boring down on, 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 on this, the, these numbers, it's payer mix. Uh, UVM Medical Center has a very good payer mix and a very low Medicaid uh, percentage of population relative to the other hospitals. And uh, it, it might be important just to understand that dynamic a little bit more. 
Um, and Maureen's question answered one of mine. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I'm good. I'll be, I'll be quick as you have the agenda. I just wanted to say thanks. I feel like the, you did a really good job this year of telling the story, and I really appreciate that. Chapter two of the story. <laughs> piece by piece. <laughs> So this is a quick review of actual MPI and FPP dollars per hospital and system-wide, the percentage of the system total that each hospital contributes, and their budget actual variance by hospital system the total. <clears throat> Noting again, the system-wide MPR fell short of budget by the 0.8% you see in the lower right-hand corner. Um, the following, starting with Rattleboro. So this is the format that you're going to see for each hospital. It is relatively high level, but these are the um, areas we chose to focus on, so it may lack some specific details. Um, but in order to move through this process, we are, are limited in our capacity as far as presentation goes. Um, so with that, Rattleboro Memorial Hospital's budget of actual variance uh, remained pretty close on both MPR and operating expenses um, from their uh, budget for 19 to what they actually produced. Um, their FY18 to FY19, you can see the NPR grew about a little over 8% from year to year and operating expenses followed at about 4%. <clears throat> uh, the result uh, was a positive operating margin of $670,000, marking the first year uh, of this of a rebound um, after three consecutive years of losses for the hospital. Up in the upper left hand corner is their budget to actual variance and their actual to actual change. So you can see per our prior note that from quarter one to quarter four of fiscal year 19, they remained right about um, on budget for what they were um, budgeted to produce for NPR. However, actual to actual, they came in at 11.8% in the first quarter and then it kind of dipped and stayed relatively stable for the rest of the year, but they still um, outproduced fiscal year 18. Their utilization was driven by acute admissions and physician office visits, um, with some OR coming in below um, the prior year. Uh, the day's cash on hand at Agent Plant, they're, they're still in solid position with 157 days. However, those three consecutive years of losses have taken a bit of a toll on that. Um, but the average age of plant remains um, remains solid at about 12 years, just over 12 years. <clears throat> so that is a, a preview of what you will see throughout here for the remaining 13 hospitals. Um, next we have Central Vermont. Their NPR fell short, 1.6% budget to actual, while operating expenses exceeded um, budget by almost 3%. Um, actual to actual growth, they saw a quite a rise in NPR and operating expenses throughout the year. <clears throat> um, the large drivers of their budget to actual variance of the negative 1.6%, they said it is reimbursement payer mix, which costs about 3.5%. Or $8 million, and bad debt and free care increases, which impacted that number by a little over $1 million. They do cite contracted labor and drug costs were primary drivers of cost throughout the year, um, which pushes that 2.9% figure you see there. Actual to actual, um, although it did exceed prior year, 6.9 and 5.7 respectively, the result in 2019 was the third consecutive year of operating losses at $4.6 million, and this was compounded in a total margin loss of about 8.8 .8 million due to um, a negative impact of pension liability funding. <laughs> so as you can see, their budget to actual variance, the blue line, um, did come in under and ended the year. The quarter is actually representative of the year in total at negative 1.6. The actual to actual change, they remained relatively constant through three quarters and then spiked at the very end. Um, for their utilization, we saw increases in OR and ER visits while acute admissions, provider revenues, and physician office visits fell short. Um, days cash on hand, um, they have, of course, incurred losses over the last several years, which is depleting those cash reserves, um, but the average age of plant remains uh, pretty solid in 12 years.
<coughs> Copley's NPR also fell short, um, falling negative 4.6 under the budget to actual, and their operating expenses also came up short, budget to actual. <coughs> um, utilization was reduced due to medical staffing matters that they cited. Um, it's been no secret from budget hearings that um, the loss of the orthopedic surgeon and slower than expected ramp up of new surgeons has caused that delay. Um, but it's really staffing related across the board from their perspective. They do cite the commercial and Medicare paradigm shift and the cost drivers. Um, there is the contracted labor again, the drug cost, and with uh, their specific situation, unfavorable health insurance claims. Um, this is the fourth consecutive year of losses, the second consecutive year where losses have surpassed $2 million. Um, and that has had an adverse effect on their cash position, which is now 62 days cash on hand. Um, that puts them in a weakened and vulnerable state, and that is um, concerning. And they've been on the monitoring schedule for the last couple of years. Their budget actual variance, as you can see, fell under throughout the year, and although actual actual began at 4.8 over, settled into a, um, a pretty low increase from 0.7 up to 2.7 for the rest of the year. And as you can see, um, the utilization numbers are um, quite shocking at how, how those came down from fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19. Gifford Medical Center, they did come in 10.5% under budget. They constrained operating expenses, which is a, a theme that they've discussed with us over the course of the year. And that um, kept operating expenses 6.2% under budget. Actual actual growth, they did see a little bit of an uptick in MPR, but again, the constraint of operating expenses has, has kept that figure low. The result of that is, um, although they did post a operating loss of 400,000, they made almost a $5 million improvement in their bottom line, uh, which is promising. Uh, we do hope that can continue. Um, their strength is in their cash position at 237 uh, days. The caveat to that, though, is that the average age of their physical plant is surpassing 18 years. So in the, in the near future, they're going to have to make some renovations, which will cause a, uh, should cause a reduction to those um, days cash on hand, but um, that's their that's their cushion right now. And with the operating improvements, it's a promising outlook. Um, actual actual utilization, they did have some reductions in OR and physician office visits. And the story with um, budget for actual and actual actual is um, pretty consistent throughout the year for Gifford Medical Center. Moving on to Grace. Um, so Grace's overall financial performance did not improve as they had expected for FY19. They came in under budget minus 2.9%, although they grew 3% over the previous year in terms of NPR and PP. Their, um, they had lower than budgeted utilization in their acute admissions, which you'll see in the next slide on the, um, uh, the utilization slide. Grace also identified Medicaid reimbursement as um, a factor of their below budget performance. They track their own Medicaid reimbursement ratio and report that it's declined from 34.6% to 34.1%, meaning they're collecting less from Medicaid than they were last year. And Grace is one of the many hospitals that cites um, contract staffing and salary and benefits as a cost driver to their operating expense budget. Um, you can see below Grace's operating margin. Now we did use a consistent format for all 14 hospitals, but we know that um, Grace's total margin is also a very important part of their financial look. They ended the year at a minus 0.3% total margin, which was below their budgeted expectations. So on all counts, Grace did not improve as they had expected to in FY19. Um, on the next chart, chart it shows Before you their, go to the next one. Excuse me? Before you go to the next yeah. one, the, the numbers that you cited on the uh, Medicaid, yes. what is it a percentage of? It's the percentage, uh, the difference between their bill charges and the, the amount they collect from Vermont Medicaid. Okay. That's, and that's their own analysis. That is not our analysis. 
Uh, so on this next slide, um, it shows the quarterly results. They were off budget all year, um, although they grew a little bit year over year in actual. You can see the impact of that acute admissions minus 11% in their budget in their year over year acute admissions. Um, their day's cash on hand is relatively stable um, and we would consider it to be relatively <coughs> stable. Moving on to Mount Escutney. Um, so Mount Escutney did not improve as they had been expected to in FY19 compared to budget. They came in slightly under budget, minus 0.7 in the MPR. Um, basically no growth year over year uh, in terms of MPR. They, in their narrative, they reported to us that um, they made an effort to support the Spring Springfield patients were coming to Mount Escutney. Um, they also reported they had challenges with ACO participation. They are one of the hospitals that are experiencing a pyramid shift from commercial to Medicare. I'm sorry, yep, from commercial to Medicare. And they also cite um, the pension plan, that their pension plan obligations contributed to losses in their non-operating income. So I will just say that this is something that we have staff have flagged as an issue that we want to track, not just for Mount Scutney, but for some of the hospitals that have these pension obligations. Um, uh, let's see, so they've had a decline in their operating margin for, um, it's, I'm sorry, it's the first time they've had a negative operating margin since FY15. We do consider and they consider their cash position to be stable, which you'll see in the next slide, and they do cite their affiliation with Dartmouth as a positive support for their financial and clinical initiatives. Um, so on the next slide, you can see um, that cash position has been steadily increasing since FY16. Um, and their utilization is up year over year. However, they were under budget by minus 0.7%. Moving on to North Country. Um, as Patrick already stated, our analysis here is pretty limited because North Country did not submit a narrative. Um, so, and as of this morning, we flagged some things in their adaptive entry that require some follow-up. So, um, what you see before you is just just the data with very little analysis and interpretation of that data. They were under budget minus 1.1%. Um, their operating margin did have a recovery this year in FY19. So they went from almost a negative $2 million operating margin last year to a positive $1.6 million operating margin. Um, on the next slide, you can see that their budget to actual um, variances Big variance in the first quarter, pretty steady for the rest of the quarter. Their utilization is up in their emergency room, but very much down in their physician office visits. And you can see that their day's cash on hand has been growing for the last four years. And as soon as we get their narrative, we'll make sure that you get that. Moving on to Northeastern. Um, Northeastern experienced Increases in utilization from acute patient days their in their emergency room department, which we know is something that the board has been keeping a close eye on. They've gone up 3.7% in their emergency room visits year over year. Um, they had an accounting adjustment that actually happened in FY18 um, where they, the reference lab revenue was recorded as other operating revenue. But they're flagging that for us. It, it resulted in, a, in an amended budget order in FY18, so our budget to budget analysis, um, I'm sorry, our act uh, would be correct because it was incorporated into an amended budget order. Um, but they just wanted to point out that this was the first year that um, they were, they had it for the full 12 months. Um, they're another one of the hospitals that cites their cost drivers as contract staffing, salaries, and benefits. Um, we would consider that Northeastern perform, performance was stable in FY19 and that their cash position was stable. And you can see by their operating margin that they've had a pretty consistent and stable operating margin for um, the last five years. So um, I talk a lot about this slide, so maybe we can just go into Northwestern. And then Northwestern. So um, the most important thing to know about Northwestern this year is they implemented a new electronic health record system. And it's a step in the right direction, but it had a significant impact on their revenues. Um, and the way that it hits their revenues is it hit their utilization. 
So as we know, when a hospital implements an electronic health record, it can have a negative impact on utilization. And it really comes down to, can, it can really come down to that the, the doctor cannot see as many patients as they used to. And this happened at Northwestern. And it happened, um, our, our understanding is that it happened to a degree that they were not expecting. They estimated that the negative impact on utilization as a, um, as a result of the electronic health record was 2.6, negative 2.6 million dollars in their, in their NPR. Um, Northwestern reported that they have challenges with ACO, they had challenges with ACO participation. They also experienced an increase in bad debt and another one of the hospitals that attributes their cost drivers to contract staffing and they had unfavorable health insurance claims with their own employees. Um, so you can see from their operating margin that they have had significant operating losses in the last five years, $10 million in FY 2015, and they finished this year with minus uh, $9 million. Um, so this is a hospital that's participating in, in bi-monthly monitoring. Um, and you can see on the next slide that their day's cash on hand position is also um, diminishing, going from a high of 374 in FY15 down to 255 days um, in FY19. Um, you can really see the electronic health record implementation which happened in the, the first part of calendar year 2019, so it's coming in around Q2 of the fiscal year. You can see how their budget performance changed from Q2 down to Q3 and Q4, how their um, budget variances grew during that time period. Um, and you can see it in their utilization physician office visits down almost 15% year over year. Porter Medical Center. Uh, Porter uh, stated in their narrative that they had challenges because they had um, an accounting change for one thing, payer reform investments. They had utilization was below budget, but it increased from their previous year. They had their payer mix change from commercial to government payers. And, but what was favorable for them was they had a favorable ACO settlement for fiscal year 2018 and favorable settlements for Medicare for 18 and 19. But also this hospital was talking about cost drivers that included contract staffing. So those items uh, make it that they have a budget to actual variance of 0.5%, so they basically um, hit their budget and then also for their operating expenses at 0.5 percent. Actual to actual, the NPR grew 5.7 percent and operating expenses grew 6.7 percent. This hospital has been improving greatly since 2015 where they had a negative 1.7 million operating margin and now they're 4.7 million. Um, that, these drivers of that operating um, margin is the ACO and Medicare settlements. The, um, as you can tell by their um, budget variance, uh, budget to budget and actual to actual growth, they started out in the negative and then they ended up in the positive. Their budget um, growth was 0.5% uh, and actual to actual was 5.7%. This hospital also saw increases in their utilization, actual, actual, definitely in acute admissions and operating room procedures and a little bit in their emergency room. Um, Porter has gained in greatly, I like to say that word, um, in their day's cash on hand. If you knew this hospital back in the 2013-14, they were struggling and now they're in 128 days cash on hand. And their age of plant is about 13. Rutland uh, Regional Medical Center, they came in just about at budget for their NPR, but they are 2.2% in their operating expenses. The actual, the actual growth was 1.2% for NPR and 2.2% for operating expenses. This hospital saw um, increases in bad debt and free care. They also were a hospital that changed, had a payment exchange from commercial to government payers and they found challenges in participating in the ACO. The cost drivers for um, Rutland in the pharmaceutical cost was the new drugs and oncology and also contract staffing. 
Um, Rutland is a hospital that saw improvements in their operating margin, um, but it did not achieve their budget of what they expected. Um, but they, as we are noting it, they even noted in their narrative that they haven't met it for three years in a row. What has helped this hospital is their other operating revenue, 340B, to help on these margins. They also have, they mentioned in their narrative, um, the gross revenue was over budget, but they needed to increase their bad debt and reserves, so that ends up making a less NPR. And that's what we've noted in other hospitals. Um, Rutland's uh, quarterly information for budget to actual, and then actual, a growth for the, um, the, the actuals were 1.2% by the end of the year, and then as we noted before, for their budget to actual was a negative 0.6%. The um, utilization was kind of mixed. We didn't want to really see them have higher emergency room visits, but they also had higher operating room visits. But the all payer model would want to see less acute admissions. The day's cash on hand is um, stabilizing, but it did go down for 2019, and their um, agent plant is about 14 years. Southwestern Medical Center. This hospital, again, was basically on budget at, at minus 0.8%, but not on operating expenses. That's higher by 1%. Their actual, the actual growth is 1.8% in NPR FPP, and operating expenses 4.6%. This hospital participated in all three ACO pair programs, but they had challenges in that participation. They invest in um, telemedicine in their ICU. They did see lower inpatient volumes, which we want to see for the all payer model. They are another one who had a payer mix shift from commercial to government payers. And another hospital, their cost drivers were contract, staffing, salaries and benefits, and drugs. This hospital also has oncology drugs. Um, we think that Southwestern is a stable hospital through fiscal year 19. Um, they, be, they also said that contributing factors to their operating margin is the other operating revenue, 340B, grant income, and other items. Um, they are a hospital that has regularly had a positive operating margin for a number of years. So as of this year, it's $5.6 million, or 3.3%. The this hospital's um, actual to actual change start, has um, started out positive and has continued to grow. They had a dip in the second and third quarter, and then it leveled off at the fourth quarter, 1.8 percent. Budget to budget was a negative 3.9 percent in the first quarter, and then the end of the year at a negative 0.8 percent. This hospital's main utilization was seems to be in physician office visits because their acute admissions was a negative 0.5%. Emergency room was 3.1%. Uh, this is actual to actual variances, not budget to budget. And this hospital has days cash on hand. These seem like pretty low numbers, but this is one of the hospitals that has a parent organization that also helps in the days cash on hand. Um, for fiscal year 18, their parent with their parent organization, it was almost 163 days. 19 was almost 165 days for the day's cash on hand. This is also one of the hospitals with the highest age plant. They're at um, 18, but Grace is 20 years. Springfield Hospital, this is the hospital that we've been monitoring for a couple years. They declared bankruptcy last year, and um, we are having a little trouble sometimes getting their reporting. We do have um, their unaudited data that we're using for this information. We should be getting their adaptive data within the next week or so, if all goes well. So for this report, we're saying that they came in budget to actual negative 2.1, 21.6% and the operating expenses were negative 4.2%.
actual to actual also was down 10.5% for NPR and their operating expenses growth was 6.1% down, which is good. Um, this hospital's day's cash on hand is very, very concerning. We're seeing almost 17 days. That's only as of fiscal year 19. And um, their age of plant is between 17 and 18 years. Um, they also were, are part of, um, were owned during this time period and still are at the moment owned by their FQHC. So their operating margins have been a concern since 2014 where they were negative 3.7 million and now they're a negative 9 million operating margin. UVM. Um, this is the hospital that definitely, as you've seen, drives the system averages. So we are showing UVM at a budget to budget, um, actual to, excuse me, budget to actual variance of 0.9% for the NPR and 4.9% for the operating expenses. Actual, actual growth, NPR 2.5%, operating expenses 6.6%. Their operating expenses they mentioned are mainly because of implementing and building the Miller building, and then of course implementing Epic, if we're hearing from other hospitals who are doing these EHR projects. The revenues are not coming in as expected. Their expenses are higher than expected. Uh, staffing, even though we talk about travelers, they also have contract staffing help, helping with IT that some don't take into consideration. Um, this hospital had lower than anticipated ACO revenues also. They had change in outpatient medical payment rates. And then in other operating revenue, the 340B and specialty pharmacy, this is what helped their operating margins. When you saw that, when we showed the other operating margin for specialty pharmacy, that was UVM. Um, they also had higher utilization, but it was offset by payer reimbursement rates. So this hospital is been even though they have positive operating margins it's been dropping through the last couple of years so they are now at a 31.4 million dollar operating margin for 2.2 percent um as we mentioned their utilization though for actual actual they had an increase in acute admissions we also heard that at the budget time last year because they have a surge that they mentioned. Um, we also saw the inpatient, I um, mean, excuse me, emergency room visits increase, provider work RVU and physician office visits increase. The operating room, though, decreased a little bit here. And most likely you would see that even in their fiscal year 20 because of the Fannie Allen campus. This hospital, for their budget to actual variance, started out at 2.3% and ended at um, a 0.9% over the quarters of this last year. And actual to actual, they started out at 4.8%, but then it became 2.5% for the year end, actual to actual. UVM's day's cash on hand um, was very healthy the last few years, and then it started to take a dip because of the Miller Building and Epic and probably reduced revenues caused by the um, reduction in utilization. Their age of plant is at 15 years. So before we get to uh, their board comments, we do want to say that although this seems uh, rather bleak, uh, the results don't come as a surprise. And the reason they don't come as a surprise <clears throat> is that the hospitals have been submitting for quite some time now financial documents on a monthly basis to the Green Mountain Care Board which allows us to actively monitor their financial situation. Um, this monitoring has continued into the current fiscal year 2020, and we are in possession of the <coughs> uh, first quarter of fiscal year 2020 operating results, and that monthly monitoring will continue um, in support of these uh, fiscal year uh, summary you've seen here today. Before you open it up to uh, the board and then to the public, if you want to make any comments about the expenses or? We don't have to go through them. This is really a reference section, but we will tell you what's in there. 
Um, so we consider these the key financial indicators. There's six cash, days cash on hand, operating margin, total margin. On the next slide, days payable, days receivable, debt service coverage ratio. It's showing the change from year to year with a key that shows an increase is a good thing, like an increase in operating margin is a good thing, and when a decrease is a good thing. Um, like a decrease in days receivable is generally a good thing. Um, these next few slides are the five-year looks of the key categories, NPR, operating margin, uh, I'm sorry, operating expenses, and we include in those a CAGR, which uh, is the only place in this report where that five-year CAGR um, exists. And we have a repeat of the operating margin um, slides in the back. And um, this is one thing that we did want to bring your attention to, the case mix index. Um, this was submitted to us by Boz, thank you Boz, and we put it in, in here as a reference for the for the fiscal, fiscal year 2019, but also to point out to the board, this will be the most updated information we have on case mix index as we move into the FY21 budget cycle. So, so keep that in mind that this exists, um, we have this. The one thing that has to be updated is Porter's numbers, that's why they're in yellow, um, are still being reconciled. Um, so those still need to be finalized. And then lastly, it is just a glossary for um, people who aren't familiar with some of the terms that we've used today. Okay, well I'll open it up to uh, comments or questions from the board. I have one quick one, which is my recollection from when I read the narratives on the issues with the ACO participation was that it was related to Medicare's operational claims processing issues that they had in early 2019. I just wanted to confirm that with you. Yes, the, the reason why we put them as um, challenges with ACO participation is that there was so many different ways of describing the same issue and there were issues even beyond that. So we would encourage um, the board to read the narratives to see what the specific circumstances were for each hospital. But yes, you're right, Robin. Just an observation how every hospital has its own personality and just kind of checking in um, on a couple of them. Um, I'm looking at Grace Cottage and uh, the your operating margins over recent years have not been uh, not been rosy. In fact, they've, they've all been negative. But when you go to um, uh, Grace Cottage cash on hand, um, that, that remained relatively flat. And when I uh, visited with Grace Cottage, what they said was they had a very good um, 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 a separate board that just raised fundraising mostly from out-of-state speakers, you know, but it's just, you know, um, you know, they, 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 they have problems with their Medicaid payments and, and the payment rate, um, but they make that up through a volunteer effort. Um, and my guess is that that might be why you see the cash on hand um, a kind of holding steady. Is it uh, their fundraising effort? I, I don't know that, but I'm just guessing from, uh, from past discussions that that might be what it is. That's true, that's what they said for years. And similarly, for Southwestern Vermont, um, one of the uh, wins at their back, uh, so to speak, is that they are down there in the corner of the state with Massachusetts and um, New York. And as I recall, uh, the Medicaid payments that they receive from Massachusetts and New York are higher than uh, the procedure re uh, receipts that they have from Vermont in terms of per procedure per procedure rate and uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, if that still is kind of a, a, a truth for Southwestern that you know they, they have New York people and they have people from North Adams coming in and uh, uh, that helps them uh, quite a bit. I'm just scanning I'm just looking at their narrative to see if they call it out specifically which they don't um, so if that's been the trend year over year then it's probably still the trend, but they don't call it out specifically. Well, I, I raise that just for comparison's sake, because I, I do think that payer mix and cost shift are substantial structural problems. And here you have one hospital that uh, might be, um, uh, you know, in circumstances that aren't, that, it's, that they aren't as affected by that. And, uh, and you might, and so what we're seeing in there, in terms of their, their budget health is, uh, of the fact that they have a, um, a large constituency of their 
patients coming from out of state? Then it's more of a hypothetical question than mm -hmm. a, a statement of that. Okay, anyone else? If not, then I will open it up to the public for any comments or questions. And if you could uh, rise, state your name and title, which would be whatever organization you might represent, and then uh, direct anything through the chair. Perfect. Susan. Um, Susan Aronoff, Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, Senior Planner and Policy Analyst. And just a quick question. I'm wondering if the narratives that were referred to are available on the website, and if so, where? Because I've just surfed around a little bit and wasn't able to find them. I can tell you exactly where. So uh, from the Vermont, and yes, Eric posted, from the Vermont Care Board webpage on the left hand side, there's a menu and you click on hospital budget review. And then the way we've organized it is by a fiscal year. So you would click on fiscal year 2019 actual and everything is in there. And uh, more than just the narratives. And as soon as we get North Country, we'll post it. Thank you. Hey, anyone else from the public? Yes. Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, for the University of Vermont, Medical Center, they were $65 million over budget from an expense perspective. And I think it's very important we'll to break down the line items under that. $18 million came from what well, came from workforce challenges. And what I'm getting at is I think you're going to start to see a repetitive story through much of the hospitals, not all of it is the same, but I really think we need to start to think about when we build our budgets and what sustainability means, there's a conversation coming up, but you need to work, look at workforce separately, you need to look at pharmaceuticals separately. There was a $22 million unfavorable variance in pharmaceuticals. Much of that flows back through the revenue line for NPR, not all of it. Uh, some of that goes to other revenue too. Um, and then there was $8 million in supplies, which goes back to um, taking care of the patients that we serve. So $30 million was directly related to the patients that we serve. And one could argue that the $18 million is directly um, uh, on the workforce or the contract labor is directly related to the patients that we serve. And in some of these, there are correlation NPR dollar amounts that flow through because it's just a pass through. A drug that you use to treat a patient that comes to your facility for treatment, it comes through on the expense side and it comes through on the NPR side. So as we think about how we break down these budgets a little bit more and how we think about what a reasonable growth is will to lead to what a sustainable margin is. And a sustainable margin is, is how do we make sure there's still 14 hospitals on that list in the future? I think we're gonna have to break down these conversations in a little bit more detail versus just taking a single NPR approach across. Um, so, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Yes, Bob. Thank you. Bob Big, CEO at the Howard Center. I just have two clarification questions. In the um, days of cash, is that a point in time or is that a 12 month moving average? And then for the financials that are being reported, are those um, consolidated financials of the entire um, related corporations or is this the data only for the operating corporations? Thanks. So the days cash on hand is at a point in time, and the um, operating figures you see up here are for the hospitals only. Wait, I just say what, what the point in time is. Oh, sorry, this is your end. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you. 
All right. Uh, Sarah Lindbergh, Health Services Researcher with the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm here to uh, review the first half of this presentation about the 2018 all-payer total cost of care results. Uh, and then Michelle will be talking about some proposed technical changes to our agreement with our federal partners. <coughs> that is a large font. So, to be a little cavalier here, we're going to start with some conclusions and just say that 2018 was the first year for the majority of the all care model. Um, we have the benefit of our partners at um, Medicaid having a pilot year in 2017, but that was a very different network than partic participated in 2018. And as such, comparisons therefore um, in the ACO and out of the ACO aren't particularly meaningful without some su substantial adjustments to the data. So we'll be working on that as some next steps to look at how we can get a more apples to apples look at the costs and utilization um, as they compare. But in 2018, the ACO controlled very little of the expenditures in our system. So this is about the state of Vermont's performance according to the agreement. This is not an assessment of one care Vermont. So just want to make that crystal clear from the get-go. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with a potentially boring lecture about uh, data analysis and how our regulatory processes differ. Um, so whenever I think about uh, starting an analysis in this realm, there's two main lenses I try to think about. Is this really a resident look? Is it based on where people live and it doesn't matter where they get their care? Or is it a provider look and it's based on where the care was delivered? So the all care total cost of care is an example of a resident-based analysis. So how many people who live in Vermont, what's the average cost um, for medical care for that population? So they might go anywhere else in the United States to get their care. We're still on the hook, so to say, for that spending. Versus what you just heard about, hospital budgets. That's very much a provider analysis. So no matter who shows up through the door, be they a Vermont resident or not, that's a very much a different um, population to look at. Denominators, much easier resident look, because we know where it is. Much trickier for a hospital, because you know your denominator would be who could potentially show up with appendicitis, which is a very hard thing to guess. <laughs> so um, in 2017, which is our most recent expenditure analysis, our resident spend for Vermont in, uh, was $6 billion. And it was a little bit higher if you look at the provider spend, 6.2 million. These numbers are much higher than anything we're regulating. But this is if you take the full picture of the pie, including a lot of things that um, you might not traditionally think about as healthcare expenditures. And that, that's why it's such a useful tool to try and look at that. So we have two principal financial targets. And again, this is for the all-pair model agreement. That's statewide, federal agreement. It involves some ACOs, but this is not a, an ACO thing. This is a statewide target. And we have the all-payer total cost of care and a Medicare total cost of care. We're just going to be talking about the all-payer total cost of care today. Um, we should be able to release results for the Medicare total cost of care very soon, but there was a bit of a um, hiccup in our data need for that, so we'll get that out as soon as we can. But for the, um, they're both resident-based analysis, so it's Vermont residents. And for our all-payer target, we're aiming that our growth between 2017 and 22 on average is 3.5%, um, whereas for Medicare, we're aiming for that same time period that our observed growth is below national projections by 0.2 percentage points. So to contrast um, our regulatory functions here with the total cost of care, we'll start with hospital budgets. And for each of these, there's two different ways they're different. One is the populations involved, and the other is what they're measuring. So if you want to compare the all-payer total cost of care with our hospital budgets, the all-payer is Vermont residents, and it's going to include money for the care delivered within the HSA or within the state and outside of the HSA where the person lives, um, and then outside of the HSA, including out of state, even out of country at times. So that is all that's included for our all-payer total cost of care. Non-Vermont residents are completely out of the picture. We don't have their data. Um, so th that spending, even though it's in our system on both the resident and provider side, is not included in, in the total cost of care that we're measuring today. 
Whereas from the hospital budget perspective, it's people who um, are in Vermont or out of Vermont, but show up at the door for that hospital. So much different population that we're talking about. Um, and depending on the hospital, it can be dramatically different. And so what it's measuring, how are those things different? So the all-payer total cost of care is looking backward at actual expenditures for a fixed population. And it's even just a subset of those medical expenditures. We're talking about medical claims and the prospective payments through Medicaid's all-inclusive population-based payments, shared savings and losses, as long as and some blueprint and sash payments. So that's all that's included in our total cost of care. And to think about an analogy, it's if all Vermont residents had to submit the invoices for their car repair to a database, we'd just be looking at those repair costs and trying to figure out the average cost to maintain a car in this state. So it's, it's just looking at bills backward and trying to figure out, on average, what it costs to take care of a population. Whereas hospital budgets, this is an estimate for future spending of an unknown population. They can have some pretty good guesses based on the past, but it's a much broader set of information. So they not only have to think about the care that's being delivered, but there's maintenance and equipment, salaries and fringe. They have to worry about care that doesn't get reimbursed. There's taxes and drugs and supplies. So a hospital budget would be more like the mechanic shop and what the, that they have to think about to keep their doors open. So it's much more than what it costs to, to repair cars. They've got staff to take care of. They've got supplies to buy. So it's a much better, it's a much different look than this total cost of care thing. Now, insurance rate review. So again, total cost of care, just care in and out of an HSA for Vermont residents. Rate review, that's the kind of untidiest of them all because <laughs> it has, um, the whole insurance industry works on where um, the business is located or where the policy is in place. So sometimes you might not be a Vermont resident, but work for a Vermont employer. So your insurance is, is goes through the uh, insurance process here in our state. So they theoretically um, might check all of these boxes. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so again, um, all payer total cost of care, just a subset of medical expenses looking backward. Um, that would be like taking a, a whole database of car repair receipts and trying to figure out what it, what it costs to maintain a car for Vermonters. Whereas rate review, again, is trying to estimate the future. And it's an unknown population. They also have a, more of a lag. So they're looking two years ago, basically, um, for historical data and trying to trend that forward for the upcoming um, year. And then the premium is going to cover more than just medical expenses. Um, there's administrative costs. They need to contribute to their reserve in case something bad happens so they can still foot the bill for anything they're at risk for. And then they have plenty of assessments and fees of their own to cover. So this is, in our analogy, like your insurance premium for your car. So, you know, I don't, I don't often think like about the connection between my insurance premium and what my mechanic charges because those feel like really different things to me. And I think that's kind of analogous in this situation here. They're just different populations for different measures. Finally, our ACO budgets. And here, again, um, they're the most similar in that most of the people attributed to the ACO are Vermont residents. Um, but at least the way our Medicare program works is that you don't need to live in the state to be attributed to a Vermont provider. So there are, in fact, some non-Vermont residents that are attributed to the ACO, and the ACO is on the hook for all that spending, but we don't have it in our total cost of care because as of today, we don't have that data available. And so, again, we're looking at the receipts, looking backwards to try and figure out what it, the average cost was to take care of our Vermonters, whereas an ACO budget, again, is forward-looking. They're trying to estimate um, before these contracts are finalized what they think the, the targets are going to be for their populations. Um, and they also have, you know, some operational expenses and investments in our population health program. So, again, it's a broader set of financial information in a for, for future looking direction instead of a backward looking one. So if we um, compare expenditures, um, so here we have the 2017 expenditure um, analysis total. Again, this is for Vermont residents. There's that $6 billion. So of that $6 billion, 
48% is included in what we call the total cost of care for purposes of the all-payer model. And it's actually going to be a little bit less than that because um, odds are this will go up in 18, but it's the most recent data we have available, so close enough though. <laughs> so about half, basically, is included in the all-payer total cost of care. Things that are notable exclusions include retail pharmacy, um, uh, anything that is delivered through a Medicaid program outside of DIVA, uh, including some home-based and community services. Um, we also have uh, you know, a ton of governmental activities. You can kind of, and we're working on ways we can help better represent these exclusions in the next expenditure analysis to help kind of frame some of that. So of the total spend, what we're on the hook for for the all-payer model is only about half of that total spending. And in 2018, if you look at One Care Vermont's actuals, they only had 10% of that total spend, and some of that's actually out-of-state residents. So even less than 10% of their spend is controlling anything to do with this. So that's why I just want to be really clear. This is a statewide analysis <laughs> for our all-fire model agreement. So uh, here we're, again, going to talk just about the all-payer total cost of care uh, performance in 2018. So if we look at what the per-person total cost of care was in 2017 as compared to 18, our growth rate was 4.1%. Now that exceeds the target of 3.5%. We are considered on track um, as long as it's below 4.3%. So um, higher than we'd like, um, but not a trigger um, that, we, that is of concern at this point. Um, and again, there are no annual targets in the agreement. We just have to check in to make sure whether or not we're on track each year. So um, we won't know what the fat lady has to say until 2023. So if we look at that, um, the actual per member per month cost went from $501 up to $521. And if we look at that by payer type, uh, Medicare grew statewide at 4.4%, uh, commercial at 1.5%, and we'll break down some of these um, numbers in subsequent slides. Um, but uh, Medicaid is the one that grew the most at 6.5%, um, but you'll notice that even though it's the highest growth, it's the lowest dollars, so that means it has kind of less leverage on that. Um, and if you want to look at the ACE, uh, Medicaid growth uh, within and outside the ACO, you can see that on a per member per month basis, the ACO um, per member per month actually went down from 17 to 18 and grew quite a bit more outside the ACO. Um, not any conclusions to draw at this point. Um, that's probably largely explained by attribution algorithms and population more than anything else, and that's part of why we know more detailed apples to apples comparison is warranted. So, um, but we do want to flag that um, these numbers all are post the quote unquote hold harmless provision of the agreement, which um, deducts uh, allowable price increases from Medicaid. So this is, these are the official numbers we're on the hook for for the purposes of the all-payer model agreement. Uh, so just to break that down, um, so on the left-hand side here, we have um, the proportion of the total cost of care by payer type. And on the right-hand side, we have the proportion of the total cost of care membership. So Medicare, while they make up 45% of this um, 2.9, Billion, thank you. <laughs> I'm really bad at math in my head. Um, <laughs> uh, that total spend, it's only 27% of the population. So again, this is a lot more influenced by the dollars than the number of people. So because they're more expensive, they have more leverage on influencing it. Commercial is, is more flat, one to one, 40% of the spending and 44% of the market. And Medicaid makes up uh, about 30% of the population for primary insurance coverage in the total cost of care, but only 15% of the total cost of care. So we're going to just uh, break out some of these uh, pair types into some chunks. So uh, accountability for um, the uh, Medicare breaks down into two um, populations and stage renal disease. Again, um, these are folks who are eligible because um, they are dealing with some significant kidney problems. Um, and they uh, are more expensive, even though there's not very many of them. So they did not show much growth. And the growth target tends to follow the non-ESRG just because there's so many more of them. Did I tilt that so far? Okay. <laughs> just must be dizzy. Um, 
And then uh, if you compare, so uh, the total Medicare PMPM was 878. Um, for those attributed to the ACO, it's $961. These numbers might look different than what you're used to looking at because these are allowed amounts. Um, so again, that's the paid by Medicare plus the member's responsibility. We find, uh, we, we think it's really important that we include the member responsibility because we wouldn't wanna, you know, um, be able to meet a target by sh shipping costs onto members, basically. So um, I wouldn't be surprised that um, those who are attributed would have a higher total cost of care because in here we have people that never see the doctor or those who just have Part A or Part B premiums. So they tend to be a less expensive population for Medicare. Um, so for our commercial market, so the real story here is our Medicare Advantage business, which is increasing, um, actually sh showed a substantial decline at 8% uh, between 17 and 18. Now I think that part of this, and I'm investigating right now, might have to do with an, a coding issue where uh, one of our uh, submitters was using the wrong product code for their Medicare Advantage business. So we're trying to sort that out to get that right. Um, but nevertheless, um, that 1.5% uh, commercial growth rate which I found surprising is largely thanks to this Medicare Advantage um, change in the claims. And I think that's also explaining maybe why we're seeing a decline in our fully insured population as well. Um, so uh, once we get that right, we can always update these numbers. Um, and then our self-funded business, and again, this is limited to the data we have available in VCURES, which is a substantial subset, particularly of our self-insured business in the state. It's um, either those municipal plans that don't have a choice about submitting data, or those voluntary submitters to which we are very grateful. Um, and so here we actually see that, the, um, again, that the PMPM is higher for the ACO attributed population. Um, however, that's only true for the fully insured population. Uh, the self-funded was a little bit um, lower, but that's really just um, reflecting the risk pool for that self-funded employer. I, I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, another reason why this, um, these adjustments are so important to be apples to apples. Is there a second question? Yeah. My question. Yeah. That coding error that you mentioned, or possible coding error, is that going to affect the negative 7.7? No, it would just um, bring this number down and this one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would all come out in the wash. But okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Uh, so then uh, Medicaid, uh, so uh, here are the unadjusted uh, PMPMs for the ACO and the non-ACO populations. So here you see a decline of 1.5% for those attributed to the ACO across the years and an 11.5% growth uh, for those not for uh, blended 8.9% growth rate. Once you make the adjustments for the permissible bulk price increases, that's where you get the numbers you see below. Um, so we're, um, you know, actively working with our colleagues at Medicaid to try and help unpack what can explain some of this. We know that it's certainly part of it is utilization and potentially the intensity of utilization, but we um, want to be careful before, before drawing too many conclusions because you know, we want to be fair and, and make sure we're accurately representing um, this stuff. But again, uh, even though it was high growth because it's relatively less dollars, um, it's having less of an influence on our, our all-payer target. And we're only on the hook for that all-payer target uh, in this analysis. So it's good to know what's happening underneath the hood. Um, but uh, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. So um, just for a minute to, to go back to our conclusions. Um, I mean, I wanted to say for this slide, basically, you know, hashtag too soon, you know, like we have just one base here under our belts for this all payer thing. Um, there's a lot of comparisons we still need to look at. Um, and we will be, as next steps, really unpacking, particularly the utilization piece and plan to um, produce a interactive dashboard on the website that will help expose that to interested parties and you'll be able to download that information for yourself. Um, and again, these are statewide, all-payer model results, so this is, should not be conflated with um, our ACO at all. Any questions before we turn to the technical changes portion of the uh, presentation? I don't really have more of a comment than a question, but uh, in thinking about the, the target versus the 4.3, uh, both of those numbers were calculated based on historical economic growth. So uh, in my thinking about it is since we know that healthcare spending historically has grown faster than 
state economic growth, whether we're talking 3.5 or 4.3, I still feel like 4.1 is a pretty good result because that means uh, we have, at least for one year, which is not a trend, so who knows, um, uh, managed to get within uh, state economic growth historically. And I, my recollection from that calculation, and Tom, I think, actually did these more recently, so he may have a clearer recollection, uh, was that the 3.5 included some of the, the recession, whereas the 4.3 was really predated the recession, so it might be uh, a more a better number in some ways. Just, but I think it's always good to strive, um, you know, to give ourselves a challenge, which I think the 3.5 does. So, that was just my thinking on that, for what it's worth. I just want to comment on the 1.5% commercial, um, which doesn't really jive with what we know is increasing in commercial um, year over year. And, do we think that that attributes really to what's not counted in the total cost of care? You know, pharmacy, things like that, that may be growing at a higher rate? Because, you know, the 1.5 is clearly helping us on the 4.1 number that we got in total, right? And if that had been, you know, a, a 3.5 or something like that, you know, we would be well over at the 4.3%. So I'm just a little, curious as to how good we feel about 1.5% increase in commercial. Yeah, so retail pharmacies exclusion is definitely a big deal. Um, yeah, and uh, again, like when we think about how premiums change, that's a much different um, calculation than the way that this, this real subset of medical expenses are changing. But I, I think the, the biggest driver really is our um, increasing market penetration for Medicare Advantage and that a healthier population seems to be selecting those plans. So because we're coding um, Medicare Advantage to commercial, um, which is you know in black and white in the agreement, not really up to us, um, I think that's really the, the story there. 3.5% is less crazy, which was the fully insured trend. Yeah. Yeah, and if I remember, we could actually pull out from the filings uh, what the medical trend is for Medicare Advantage. So we could do the still not apples to apples, but I think we were seeing 2.6 on the medical trend for QHPs. And that, that would be what I would consider most analogous to uh, with this community. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say hashtag thank you. <laughs> and, um, especially particularly appreciated the beginning slides where you tried to break down the populations in each of our regulatory processes and you know resident, non-resident, all the fantastic thank you. It's always hard to follow Sarah, and I always get paired with her. <laughs> uh, so I have the uh, Michelle degree, health policy advisor for the board. I have the pleasure of walking you through uh, some technical changes to the all-pair model agreement um, that are currently out for your review. <clears throat> so. Uh, in carrying out our responsibilities under the agreement, the GMCB staff and CMMI identified a need uh, to amend the agreement. Uh, these amendments uh, that are being contemplated are technical in nature and are intended to do four things. So first is to define a process by which the GMCB could submit one or more proposals to modify the Medicare ACO initiative. We currently already have that ability under the agreement. It's just allowing for more than one. Uh, address data sharing between CMS and the GMCB for health oversight activities. Um, Sarah sort of talked about that before with our access to Medicare data. Address, <coughs> excuse me, uh, improves the accuracy of financial and quality performance reports by revising reporting deadlines to allow for more complete data. And it allows us to update certain quality reference points to better reflect actual performance for existing measures. Um, so this slide here, I just want to start by reminding folks that we began this conversation specifically on the quality framework uh, back in July after our federal partners uh, came for a visit. Um, and I presented some of this information to the board um, at a pretty high level at that point in time. But now that we've had the opportunity to work with our federal partners, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive today into what really the result of those technical changes looks like. Um, it's important to note too here, much like Sarah said, these changes are not to the measures themselves, but to the performance year five targets, and in some cases, the associated baselines. 
And also to note that we're talking about those measures here for which the state is accountable under the all fair model agreement. We're not talking about ACO responsibility. Um, we're talking specifically about those measures that the state is accountable for. Um, while some of them are ACO specific, that is separate and apart from the ACO's agreements with the payers. Um, so I'll also note um, that you know, in some of these discussions, we have communicated with CMS, CMMI, and have sort of a preliminary agreement that it would make uh, a good amount of sense to update the base years uh, in the agreement to reflect data that's relevant to the model's performance now that we're starting to produce reports. Um, at the time the agreement was signed in 2016, the base year reflected the most recent data available, and in some cases that was back to 2013 or 2014. So using those reference points now, producing data for 2018 seems a little silly. Um, but so we're going to propose to update those um, to 2017 as a base where applicable or available. Um, and in cases where the measurement is specific to those ACO attributed lives, we would um, propose updating and utilizing 2018 as the base year. So year one performance and 2018 would be the same. And the reason for this is that that's the first year of the next generation multi-payer ACO initiative. So for models where we're measuring multi-payer ACO performance, it doesn't make sense to use a reference population that was not in fact multi-payer ACO uh, attributed lives. Um, and one final note before I move on, these technical changes are currently under review with CMS's Office of the General Counsel, um, and um, all proposed language is subject to change based on any comments that they might have. <coughs> and we would, of course, bring that back to you. <laughs> so here's the fun part. <laughs> uh, for suggested technical changes, so on the previous slide, I had noted that we broke these down really into categories. So one of the big things is the HEDIS measures. Uh, which are claims-based measures that are referenced in the agreement. Um, the HEDIS benchmarks would have required the state to purchase a, a tool called Quality Compass, which is a product from NCQA, um, and it provides payer-specific benchmarks. Um, as we started to gather some data and sort of investigate, it was realized that the data for, from Quality Compass are both proprietary, so once we received it, we couldn't publicly report it, um, and incredibly cost prohibitive. Uh, it would have cost the state about a million dollars for the duration of the agreement to purchase that benchmarking tool. Um, and then again, we wouldn't be able to actually publicly report out where the benchmarks fell because that data is proprietary. Um, so the goal with these five measures, so it, I know it looks like four, but initiation and engagement are two. Right there. <laughs> uh, are two separate ones. So. Um, we wanted to remove, of course, as I just said, the percentile references that were currently in the agreement language um, to update it to utilize, um, sort of follow along some of the other metrics and really just set a, a hard target, for lack of a better term, uh, for performance year five. So we did work um, with contractors and payers to sort of talk about some of the rates that we're proposing here as our targets, again, for performance year five of the model. Um, for the last measure, you'll note there's a, another little fun fact there, which is um, the medication management measure itself, there's actually two ways to calculate that, and it was not set out in the agreement which <coughs> performance metric to use. So it's utilizing the same measure, but there's a 50% compliance and a 75% compliance rate. Um, this just codifies the decision to use the 50% compliance rate as our rate moving forward. Uh, and the second grouping is uh, specific to measures that reference the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Um, so for the measures listed here, which are all referencing an MSSP target, um, CMMI actually noted that there is, in fact, no 75th percentile produced, which is what the agreement refers to, um, which is why you'll see it's been updated to reflect a decile range. Uh, that is how CMS produces and reports and uh, measures against their targets. Um, so that's that was you know, a choice that was made to uh, get at that 75th. So, for the first measure here, um, it's Medicare specific. It's going to remain the same again with the exception of proposing to update those percentile ranges. The second measure, the chronic conditions target, um, 
CMS and the Medicare Shared Savings Program actually disaggregated this measure, so we would follow suit. Um, we wouldn't want to report a composite measure that's no longer comparable to national um, performance, so we would also suggest disaggregating the measure and produce three separate rates and three separate performance targets um, for these measures, so it would bring the total number of reported measures in the quality framework to 22, um, as opposed to 20, as it was before. Uh, the last two measures, the tobacco use assessment and the screening for clinical depression, um, both of these measures require both claims and clinical or chart review uh, data, and because of this clinical aspect, these measures can actually only be aggregated, weighted, and then reported for those payer programs who contract with the ACO to collect and report this measure. So we are able to receive numerator and denominator data from the ACO on their performance on these measures. It's reported through their budget review. We receive that. Um, and then I'm able to weight the performance based on that submission and the uh, proportion of the population. Um, and again, here we would need to update the performance range to indicate the 70th to the 80th percentile because there is no 75th. <coughs> so one of the final technical changes, so there's two um, reporting timeline technical changes that we are proposing. So um, as you see here, the first quality report was initially due on September 30th of the year following each performance year. So in other words, the 2018 report would have been due on September 30th of 2019. Uh, this timeline doesn't work for several reasons. The first being that some of the measures rely on survey data that are collected through the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Um, these results are produced by our partners at VDH and are actually not available until late fall of the year following survey implementation. So we wouldn't be able to report them in our uh, federal reporting. Um, additionally, utilizing six months of runout for the claims measurement allows for more accurate performance calculations and is something that, um, through the board, we're trying to utilize as sort of best practice for all of our uh, reporting metrics that utilize claims data. So the proposal here is to extend that deadline to December 31st of the year following each performance year. So the 2019 reports will then be due December 31st of 2020. And I have a slide that tries to make this a little easier. Uh, the next technical change that we're suggesting um, is for the total cost of care reporting. So currently there's a September 30th deadline, and again, doesn't really allow us um, any adequate claims run out. So the proposal here um, is to extend to December 31st. And this change aligns with the reporting deadline. Um, for the quality framework that I just discussed, and it allows for adequate claims run out, and um, given um, that we would like to use six months, the state also proposes here to produce a fifth final annual report, um, and that's what Sarah presented on today. So that's the total cost of care data that you saw today that included six months of run out. Um, and so this is just sort of codifying that decision to add an additional report and have that complete by December 31st of the year following each performance year of the model. <laughs> Clear as mud, I know. <laughs> uh, so here's just a, a timeline to try and wash it out. <laughs> um, so this is just looking at 2020 and how the impact of the changes would be seen through the rest of this performance year. So you see statewide health outcomes down here in December. Um, total cost care is not on there, but it would go right there. <laughs> I knew I missed one. Um, and that's just, you know, to sort of give a breakdown of where all of our reports fall throughout the performance years. Um, these are, again, technical changes. They are on our website, and they'll be open for public comment uh, through, we're looking at March 10th at this point, um, with a potential board vote on these proposed changes um, on the 11th. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board for Michelle? <laughs> if not, I'm going to open it up to the public for um, comments or questions. Again, stand up, say your name, your title, and organization, and address it through the chair. Uh, 
Our policy analyst and a similar question to the one from before. Um, is there some written version of the proposed measure changes other than what exists in these slides? Yes. There is um, a proposed measure change that is version of the agreement that um, outlines all of the changes and it's on our website under the all pair model tab and it's like one of the first things on there. I'm looking at Abigail to make sure I'm correct. It's actually on the public comment tab. If you go to the public comment uh, right on our landing page and you click on that, you'll see ongoing special comment periods and then it lists this one, February 26th through March 10th, um, the proposed technical changes to the all-pair model, and there are links within that to any of the documents related to the technical changes. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Seeing none, I want to thank you both. Okay, so um, I'm Alina Berry, Director of Value Chain Programs, ACO Regulations. And I'm Patrick Rooney, Director of Health Systems Finance. Okay. And before we start, we just wanted to provide some background on how we arrived here today. Um, so I, you've probably seen this slide a number of times, especially throughout the World Health Services Task Force presentations. Um, but as you know, since 2005, 166 rural hospitals have closed nationally and 25% of rural hospitals are predicted to be at mid to high um, risk of financial distress. Um, so that was apparent, you know, if not in our budget cycle, a hospital budget cycle this um, earlier this afternoon with our 19 actuals, you can kind of see that here in Vermont. Um, so that risk, um, that has been growing. Um, so this kind of reflects some of that that you've seen this morning, um, highlighted on the last, oh, I'm sorry, Patrick, I'm taking <laughs> <laughs> so by now this slide looks familiar to everyone here in the audience uh, with the growing number of hospitals falling into the red. Um, sustainability is creeping onto the scene as a topic for consideration. There's a growing number of uh, literature out there on this topic, which means that Vermont is not alone when beginning to look at this type of um, theory for how do we make our hospitals more sustainable. And up here on the left side in the yellow, you have these six hospitals that are uh, currently ordered to participate in the sustainability plan in the coming year. So this conversation is not new. Um, starting earlier this or last year, uh, we had um, a panel discussion. Um, that highlighted a number of things. We brought in an expert also from Stroudwater to participate in this panel and some of the outcomes. Um, we're talking about these national pressures, um, but you know, kind of reassured us that we were on the right track with our all-payer model in terms of what could be done at this point to address um, these issues um, and to help stabilize revenue um, and focusing on population health and preventative care, which is really critical to kind of um, getting, getting our arms around this. However, you know, our, our hospitals are still experiencing the defeat in two canoes, if you will, um, with their existing financial and economic headwinds. You know, we talked about earlier today, and uh, we hear commentary um, as well from the VM on pharmaceuticals and workforce and supply costs as being these really important drivers of um, these trends. Um, in addition, at the same time, we're asking our hospitals to engage in healthcare reform um, and move towards value-based models where they get more predictable payments, but also um, doesn't create that dollar for dollar that you'll see in NPR, um, as you heard earlier today. Um, this in conjunction you know, with Act 20, or sorry, 26, um, the legislature kind of um, acknowledged their, um, their commitment to this issue, and the Rural Health Task Force commented and made a number um, of presentations or recommendations, including those at, about uh, hospital closures. Um, they focused on workforce, telemedicine, care coordination, and made actionable recommendations to the General Assembly um, on these areas that are, are being pursued. Uh, so the first three of these um, uh, 
you know, we're are in line with the bipartisan policy center's recommendations, our, our representative of rural health services task force uh, recommendations, but number four, um, which I will read, uh, to allow rural communities to adjust their own health care services to better fit the community's needs, including changes to critical access hospitals, small rural clinics, and rural hospitals, is really about right-sizing and finding what the right services are uh, for our communities to provide. Um, so that's what the sustainability plan hopes to address and kind of rounding out um, an approach to ensure that our uh, rural health uh, model is a sustainable one. So um, as you know, we memorialized this concern in the hospital budget process this past summer with the requirement for six of the 14 hospitals to submit uh, sustainability plans. And um, to reiterate the goals for today, you know, staff, uh, we're going to provide an update on the sustainability framework and hope to have board discussion and feedback on that framework and then outline some next steps. <coughs> So the goals of the sustainability plans. Um, so we worked you know, with a number of parties and, and discussed with our hospitals and, um, and landed on these goals for these plans. Um, so to engage in a robust conversation on community access to essential services and barriers to sustainability of our rural healthcare system. To ensure that hospital leadership boards and communities are working together to address sustainability challenges and formalizing their approach in their strategic plans over time. To identify hospital-led strategies for sustainability, including efforts to right-size hospital operations, particularly in the face of Vermont's demographic challenges and payment reform efforts. And to identify barriers to sustainability that are more aptly addressed by other stakeholders, policymakers, or regulatory bodies. Um, and the insights gained through this hospital sustainability plans may be leveraged as the state begins to think about the subsequent proposal to our all-payer model. Um, so it's important to note that you know, we recognize the community-centered focus of this model and that it should be community-driven and the intent is not to dictate which hospitals will perform which services, but rather to make sure, as was said before, that the board has all the tools at its um, disposal to ensure that we don't have another Springfield or that we can identify when there might be a risk of another Springfield and, and feel like we have the tools to problem solve as, as a state together. <coughs> Um, so we just also wanted to highlight the many multitudes of resources that went into this framework um, and informed what, what it now looks like. Um, so for the financial benchmarks, the S&P Global Ratings um, was kind of the key resource there. I won't read through all of these, but um, you know, comparing pricing across hospital methodologies, addressing healthcare needs in rural communities, there are frameworks and research out there that speaks to all these things. We are not reinventing the wheel. There are other states and um, other communities that are leveraging these resources um, to try to answer these really challenging problems. Um, in addition, which you'll hear more about later, um, the volume quality relationship, there is a substantial amount of research um, that, that uh, supports this notion and actually some countries will not reimburse um, or will reimburse only over a certain threshold. So I think there's a, you know, a lot of research and practice that suggests um, that this might be a warranted approach. We also thank Vaz and um, hospitals for their input and continue to you know, seek input on what um, is feasible and actionable and um, will really further this conversation. Uh, the framework has three main components. Uh, so first is a discussion of the hospital's financial health. The second is about ensuring provision of essential services. And the third is about um, discussing the sustainability of other services. So this is the financial profile that we mocked up from the S&P Global Ratings and Rankings Scale. And it runs from extremely strong, highly vulnerable, and the ranges within also come from S&P for um, standalone hospitals. Um, throughout their area of uh, coverage that they have. And this is an actual Vermont hospital. We're not going to call out who it is, but it, it serves as an example. And the idea here is to show where they currently stand, but also um, either progressive or regressive activity in these areas. So you can see up here <clears throat> from under financial performance, from total operating revenue down to debt service coverage, this particular hospital is, it has had no movement over fiscal year 18 or 19 
um, within those metrics. The blue represents uh, fiscal year 19, where their actual numbers fall, and the gray um, serves to recognize fiscal year 18, where their actual numbers fall. So we took their actual numbers for each one of these categories and plugged them into this scale. So for this hospital, as I stated, there was no movement. Everything stays within this high, highly, highly vulnerable um, end of the spectrum here. And if you go down here into the liquidity and financial flexibility, we have regression in, or sorry, <clears throat> We have progression in Asia Plant, where Asia Plant actually got um, younger. Their capex to depreciation expense receded, as did their days cash on hand from extremely strong to strong. And the idea here is, um, if if the hospital is is kind of camped out down here, the sustainability plan, how can we move them or help help move them up the scale by report having them report back on their sustainability? Um, so these are an example of some of the um, metrics that we'll use to show uh, where those hospitals currently stand and to monitor um, movement with respect to these metrics, either up or down. And here is, as I alluded to, um, the steps that they'll be asked to respond to regarding the profile, action steps on how to bring underperforming metrics into the adequate zone, um, the time needed to achieve those, sometimes it takes time to turn these around with some of the initiatives that they would be putting in place. And to report back on the obstacles to uh, moving up the spectrum there towards the adequate zones where they would be financially more sustainable. Great, so the second section is about ensuring the provision of essential services. So the main question that we'd like to be able to answer here is as uh, Medicare moves away for fee-for-service and the state begins developing our proposal for 2.0, our healthcare model 2.0, um, how can the hospitals capitalize on predictable payment streams and maintain access for their community to a baseline of high-quality, uh, high safe, and effective services? Um, so two main components here to think about are you know, access to essential services in an effort to achieve population health goals, um, cost efficiency, so with fixed revenues, cost accounting of service line becomes critical to understanding hospital efficiency and sustainability. We can um, kind of meet those, uh, you know, capitated payments with um, the costs that are currently serving as inputs. You know, how can we make sure we keep the doors open? Uh, the definition for essential services that we leveraged is from the American Hospital Association's Task Force on Ensuring Access in Vulnerable Communities. Um, it identifies a, a number of categories um, of services that should be considered essential um, to a community. There's primary care, prenatal, home care, dentistry, psychiatric and substance abuse services, emergency and observation services, diagnostic services, transportation, um, and a robust referral system and transfer agreements for specialty services that may not be provided locally. Um, this is just a visual of what it might look like to a hospital to, to um, submit this information. So you have a series of uh, services um, at a granular level on the left, and then um, these metrics on the right, which we will talk to in more detail in the subsequent slides. Um, so, you know, hospitals will be added. Forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. I'll just keep talking. Um, okay. Hospitals will be asked to respond to the following as it relates to essential services. Uh, the first is our community needs for that service met, partially met, or fully met. Um, then they'll be asked which entities deliver these services. Is it delivered by the hospital, FQHC, the designated agency, et cetera? Um, and then we'll ask a series of questions about financial metrics by the hospital at that service level. So contribution margin or total margin, not looking for a dollar amount, but rather is it positive or negative, just um, in a very high level. And then commercial to Medicare reimbursement ratio, Medicaid to Medicare reimbursement ratio, payer mix, and percent contribution to NPR. We would look for an estimated amount. Nothing you know, has to be precise. We're not tying anything out. We just want to understand generally um, how these services kind of um, tell tell the story. Um, are, you know, is the delivery of your service financially viable? Are you charging a reasonable rate? Um, as we move away from this fee for service, you know, is this service line contributing to your sustainability or not? 
Do we have to subsidize this essential service in some other way? Um, so those are the kinds of questions that we're looking to answer with these metrics and um, have a conversation with the hospital um, about what the right mix should look like. Have them identify that right mix. So subsequently, there are a number of follow-up questions we would ask. You know, what is the percentage? Um, uh, what percentage do the above defined essential services contribute to total NPR? For each essential service, please describe any current or future obstacles to sustainability. So as we talk about, you know, workforce um, and these other drivers, pharmaceuticals that may be outside of the hospital's control, you know, it's important to continue to identify those and if any opportunities could be identified for solutions to those problems or if we disaggregate those problems, you know, just talk about nursing versus physicians, are there particular recommendations that could be made? Um, and then we're looking, you know, like I said, for those solutions that either the hospital or some other body might be able to push forward. The sustainability of other services, so um, would be anything that was not already listed as essential. Um, it, you know, so in a value-based world, we want to prioritize those essential services because we recognize that there may be tension between the use of scarce resources at a community level. So that's why it's important to kind of look at these things separately. Um, so can the hospital deliver these services at a high quality and low cost? Um, you know, we talked a little bit, but volume's been correlated with quality, at least for surgical procedures, and are you um, able to, to provide services at a threshold that allows you to produce high quality outcomes for patients? Um, and then capacity and utilization is a proxy for efficiency. Are there underutilized resources in our system and are there ways that we can um, think about what this looks like you know, at a system level and ensure that we're being as efficient as possible? Um, especially as you know, some of these other services may not be focused on primary prevention and are more focused on specialty, are we really investing in the right areas if our theory of change is really about prevention and primary care practice? Again, this is following very similar formats, so we look to simplify and create consistency across what we were asking for. Um, and so similar to essential services, we would ask for those other services that hospitals identify the same financial metrics to understand at a service line um, what, you know, the financial viability of that service. In addition, we have a series of questions or um, like tables on capacity, so looking for information on staff bed occupancy rates, ED visits per day, and the number of births at the birthing center is present. Um, there are probably a number of ways we can get to capacity, so it would be interesting to have a conversation about that. Um, and then procedural volume, so looking at um, the number of procedures done and the number of procedures performed by the physician, um, to try to understand um, whether, you know, these quality thresholds and what the right quality threshold might be. So again, this is just a visual depiction of what that might look like. And then um, some other questions that span, you know, more broadly that are important to consider. Um, how will your institution balance the need um, to deliver care to rural patients who on average may be older, poorer, and less mobile than other patients? Um, with the need to ensure that services are delivered efficiently at a low cost and high quality. And then for commercial Medicare reimbursement rates that are greater than 150%, please describe the strategies that you intend to bring down the cost of delivering um, while maintaining access to services for all. Um, and then, you know, table four, which is about volume, is question three. Um, you know, where you have hospital, sorry, where you have volumes for services below so these thresholds of 50 and 25 that were, um, you know, identified by the literature, that literature review you saw earlier. Um, please assess whether these surgical volumes are sufficient to maintain low cost and high quality outcomes for your patients. So we would expect that conversation to be more evidence based. Um, Question four, um, so assuming that we're moving towards this value-based world um, and primary prevention and population health um, are, are our goals and hospitals are held accountable for cost and quality, please discuss what an optimized service line would look like for your hospital. Um, whether the hospital can sustainably deliver each of the services listed in what table three is referring to the other services um, table that we just um, described earlier. 
And if not, what action steps might a hospital take to move forward um, towards a cost-effective, high-quality delivery of these optimized service lines? And then what steps can hospitals take to ensure that patients have access to digested services through referral and transportation options? Establishment of regional collaboratives or other strategies. Um, and then given the existing financial and economic pressures to streamline operations, how do we simultaneously plan for an impending public health crisis? I think we've all heard about the coronavirus, but there might be other um, crises on, you know, on the verge that we should also be prepared to plan for. Um, so what is the right level of slack in the system? Because um, we don't want to get so lean that we can't adapt in, in the face of change. Almost there. All right. Please describe any current and future obstacles to sustainability and fully delivering cost-effective, high-quality care in your community for your envisioned optimized service line. And then please offer possible solutions to those obstacles, as we discussed before, it could come from the hospital or from other parties. So as next steps, we would like to discuss um, the framework and solicit any feedback you might have. Um, and then, you know, I think the next steps from there would be for staff to um, synthesize that, to identify resources for hospitals to use as they engage in sustainability planning. We're certainly happy to put together all the materials that inform this work in a place that can be um, consumed um, at their discretion. And then a special public comment period that would start today through March 11th. Um, and then we need to establish a date for publication and submission. And uh, obviously, a number of hospitals have their own primary care um, uh, providers, and uh, a lot of primary care and preventive health would be happening within the domain of the hospital. And given that population health and preventive health are core to our all care model um, uh, effort, it would seem to me that um, we would ask them to enumerate the services that they have now, in addition to asking them what. Um, you know, the services might look like three to five years from now. Sure, and I, we have, um, there's primary care and pediatric care in those broad categories, but there, like you mentioned, there is nothing further beyond preventative. We leverage the definition from the AHA to be consistent with the existing research and the existing frameworks. I think we'd certainly be open to that, and especially in the regulatory integration, but thought that the board might have opinions on what the right uh, level of detail would be. Can I respond to that? I think, I think it makes sense. I wonder if really some of it could be to just be clear that, for example, when you look at what primary prevention and population health ends up looking like, it's usually embedded within primary care, lifestyle medicine, uh, could be an OB, uh, dental. So it may be sort of part of the other labels without explicitly calling it out. So maybe we can figure out a way to make that clearer, like concept. Sorry, I'll make it right on the <laughs> And the, the other area um, is that I, you know, as we go through this process, and I know nobody believes this, that, you know, that all of the problems that our smaller hospitals have are their problems and not structural problems. And, you know, just to kind of emphasize here um, on page, uh, one of the early pages, you have the payer mix for uh, 2018, and uh, you're know, showing that at 53.2%. But the range around that uh, number across the 14 hospitals is 63.2% uh, down to as low as 30.9%. And in terms of Medicaid, which is, you know, the, the statistic here, system-wide is 11.6%. That range is 7.5% to 18%. So, um, you know, as you know, and, and I am hopeful that you know the all parent model and the fixed prospective payments, especially when they get down to a Medicaid level, that that process will allow the cost shift to kind of be mitigated, because we're going to be able to see Medicaid payments per member per month by the different uh, hospital service areas, and then be confronted with the question, why is that so? And uh, it might not, it might be that the distribution system of Medicaid money uh, is not a level playing field across all hospitals, uh, nor is the distribution of, of uh, um, the commercial payer mix. So I just want to emphasize that, that um, uh, you know, here 
no, no one is saying that, that the problems that our hospitals are having are their problems uh, and that can be solved by mixing their service mixes and you mixes and things of that sort, which will be helpful, but there's also some structural system-wide issues that are outside the control of hospitals that I think folks at the state level are gonna have to deal with. Absolutely, and I think this framework recognizes both pieces and that we're all in this together, and so I think we're just asking to know all pieces of that story. Yeah. I just want to make a comment if you could go to slide three. And I think really what you did here was, you know, it's hard to read everything there, but you can see a lot of red on the slide over to the right. And you know, really focusing on why we were concerned with this and why we wanted to look at this, and it's the you know the key word of sustainability, and saying you know it's not sustainable to stay in the red you know year after year, and we know that's not the intent of the hospitals, and that you know that they don't want to be there either, you know either, but it's as things are changing, demographics are changing, and. Many of these that are in the red, I think if we also looked at that NPR, we would see they missed their top line forecasts, and it's that whole cycle that they can't cut their expenses. So it's really trying to address, you know, what, what's the <coughs> right services for that size hospital to try to bring them into that range of, you know, what you saw was adequate even, right? Because, you know, some of them right off the top, many of these hospitals, are never going to be in the NPR level of adequate because I think the lowest was 130. So it kind of already shows that when we're looking at a national picture and then driving it down to Vermont, that many of our hospitals already fall, you know, in, into some of what would be you know, disadvantaged you know, status. And so I, I think we're you know, really just to get across that we're trying to do this to help the hospitals in the process to, to really look at you know, what services they're providing, how are they providing them, and, you know, where are things going to be in three to five years? Because if changes aren't made now, and this continues, you know, going along at status quo, you know, there will be more hospitals closing. I mean, we'll, we can't continue with three more years of negative losses for these hospitals. So I know, you know, some of this work may seem onerous, but I also think that a lot of hospitals are telling us they're doing this and they're, you know, they're already looking at this. So, you know, we're trying to help them along that, that path. And so, you know, I, I think just the earlier presentation today really highlights why we need this. And so it's a lot of good work done here. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to echo Maureen's points, I mean, I think the presentation this morning, this morning, feels like we've been here all day, doesn't it? Um, from a few hours ago, by the hospital budget team underscores why these sustainability plans are so important. And certainly, I've had questions from legislators about where are they, when are they coming, and what's it going to look like. I think well, there's a growing concern about the sustainability of our hospitals. Um, you know, and just to emphasize, the demographic challenges are real. Our population is aging and it's declining, and our fixed and variable costs are rising. And as we saw earlier, at rates higher than our revenues in many of these hospitals. And the payment models are changing at the federal level and the state level, and they're rewarding low cost, high quality providers. Um, so these hospital sustainability plans are asking hospital leaders and their boards, I don't know if this was mentioned, but the, the desire is to have hospital leaders and the boards engage in these conversations to assess their overall financial health and their capacity utilization. It also asks the hospitals to assess their service lines by asking them about service line margins and pricing and volume. Um, we're asking them to review this data and plan for a value-based future, which we are going towards, and asking them to think about how they can sustainably deliver their essential services in their communities, um, and think about this world in which we're gonna be accountable for cost and quality. What does that service line look like? I think these are the right questions, and my hope, as Maureen said, is that the hospitals are already have some of these answers for us. This process should be meaningful for them, and it's definitely gonna be informative for us. So thank you for the presentation. Else, Robin? Yeah, I think, you know, this is 
This is a hard conversation and it was always going to be a hard conversation, but I agree with what Jess and Maureen have said in terms of um, the, the trends that we're seeing in operating margins and total margins is very concerning. And uh, the way I think about it, um, to be slightly blunt, is we can plan on how to ensure that we can sustain our system or we can have it happen through closures. And we know from the Rural Health Services Task Force that a hospital closure does not just impact that hospital. It impacts the entire community in terms of the unemployment rate. It impacts the other businesses. There's uh, statistics in the report about the impact, economic impact from a, a community hospital that closes. It impacts on the services available to people. And I don't think any of us want that. So while this is a tough conversation to start and to have, um, I think we're going to serve ourselves well in the future by starting it now. Uh, I also, I'll be interested to see what we get for public comment. I also don't think this is necessarily a fast process. So I think we all have to be expecting that uh, this is not going to be a couple months and then the plans are in and we're done. Um, I think it's going to take time because if it's done well and right, it would be incorporated into the strategic planning process to the extent it may already be incorporated. And those processes, of course, are continual and constant. And you'd also hope that you would then see this uh, reflected in the future community health needs assessments, which are done every three years. So um, that's just my sense, is that if it's going to be done for real, then it's going to take some time and will require some patience. Uh, but I think that's also why we need to get started on it now. So I would just echo the patience part, especially uh, as we're coming closer and closer to um, hospitals, uh, budget submission time and things like that. I think um, there may have to be some flexibility in um, realizing that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. We can't ask people to do more than what they're structurally able to do. So with those caveats, I guess I'll open it up to the public. Jeff. Hi, Jeff Keenan with the Hospital Association. Um, I'm actually going to channel Robert Lund a little bit because I have notes all over this page, so I'm going to <coughs> do my best to get to all of them. Um, actually, I think that the comments made by Maureen Jess and Robin, um, I would largely reflect those. The, the Hospital Association and my members across the state definitely support the work to examine sustainability um, and have a sense collectively of financial stability of our hospitals, both now and into the future. So we support that work. There's a few concerns and areas I just want to comment on. Um, one of them, um, especially having just heard this presentation, is that this absolutely adds burden. So while we agree with the, the potential benefit and the hopeful outcome of this exercise, there is no doubt that this is a lot of new work on top of budget submissions that already have to be created. A lot of the sustainability hospitals are small ones with not a lot of staff and resources to do this kind of work. So just the sensitivity to the pretty substantial new reporting that's being asked for um, here. And to the point about timing, I think I'm happy to hear about patients. I think it's better to do this right than to do this fast. Um, I, Abaz is happy to consider and think about what a timeline could look like and make a more specific proposal and some written comments. Um, our point is not at all to try to delay any of this, but just to make sure it's being done right and thoughtfully given hospitals other regulatory obligations. Um, the second area I wanted to comment on is confidentiality. Um, it, the Green Mountain Care Board has heard this over and over, and I will say it over and over, um, that we have a deep concern about the information being asked for from a proprietary information and confidentiality standpoint. Um, if legislative language or other legal solutions to that problem cannot be managed, I can almost assure you that hospitals will be very reticent to provide information that, that could um, reveal proprietary data for them um, or could actually um, speak to issues at the hospital or in the community um, that, would be, that would be alarming and pro probably unnecessarily so. So preserving confidentiality just hugely, hugely important. I've heard that from every single hospital. I share that concern, um, as do all the lawyers we've talked to about this. Um, another area of caution, and again, there's a few CFOs in the room, um, Robin and Mark and, and Jen, who can speak more um, articulately to this issue than I can. 
Um, but I think on the service line um, data that's being requested, I think it's important to understand hospitals have various um, levels of ability to extrapolate that kind of information um, and that some of them may need more sophisticated um, kinds of systems to be able to do that um, in the way that, that is being asked. Um, and again, when we're talking about service line um, kinds of stuff, I think it again speaks to this really serious need for confidentiality um, given that people expect the services that are in their community to continue to be in their community and if they viewed this as an exercise to potentially change or eliminate those services, it could be um, really alarming and, and potentially problematic. I would also just say that hospitals, especially the ones in Vermont, they're nonprofit, they're mission based, and they make, determines, they make determinations about their service lines based on the need of the community which they assess. Um, and they often provide services that do not have a positive contribution to margin. Um, burn units and NICUs never make money. We desperately need them. So it's really important to understand um, that piece too. So just to reiterate, I think um, hospitals have various levels of ability to get to some of the specific data. And we want to make sure we're in conversation about that. Confidentiality is important and this will take a lot of time. Um, and this is really labor intensive. So no matter how a hospital approaches the project, um, it's an attempt to get a lot of information and will definitely require significant investment in time and effort. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, just be sensitive to um, sort of the other regulatory obligations. Um, and, and we appreciate very much the opportunity to have a voice in this process before these plans were even sort of crystallized. And as they continue to be finalized, we would appreciate our voice continuing to be part of that process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Is there other public comment? Yes, Mark. Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Board. <clears throat> These are just technical observations from the presentation. I would reiterate what Jeff said. From a system perspective, the hospital systems just aren't built to report on service lines. And I would even go so far that Vizient, which is the standard for the academic medical centers across this nation, 105, they don't even have a service line for professional services. <coughs> so that's how challenging you know, this is, um, I struggle to find the place where total margin should be, I mean, and sh should be tracked. A big impact of total margin is, is we know what just happened in the stock market the last three days and today. And I have a, how do you correlate that to what the services true impacts are from a profit or loss at a local um, basis? It really needs to be looked at direct cost to direct payments because if, if, if the payments are more than the direct cost, then those dollars go to fund the overhead. So um, that is another piece. As we think about payer mix, I think the payer mix there as it was referenced was shown as a percent of total revenue. You really need to understand the relationship of the payer mix of gross revenue and net revenue, and if those percentages are different, there's an implied cost shift, period. And you want to look at those over time to see if it's going up or going down. That is a very, very quick way of doing it. And then finally, I'd just like to say, you know, um, I guess we need to figure out what sustainability means, and I think it's good to be looking at services, because this is going to come down to services and you know, looking at the services across the various well, communities. And, um, but I think it's important to understand how we got here. We have a very, very regulated system, and these hospitals are ma managed in a very, very tight position, along with the impacts of the cost shift too. So I think, you know, these hospitals didn't get there completely all on their own. There's some decisions about rates in the past that the Green Mountain Care Board has made that has played some of the role. There's some legislative decisions with the cost shift that has played some of the role. So, you know, I think for us to figure out what this looks like for us to provide access to care as close to home as possible that what well, Vermont needs. I think it's really looking at all three of those to come together in their specific way and that's going to take time. So I mean so um, I'm neither here or there but you know those were just some technical comments well, that I saw from the presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. Public members of the public. Too close. I'm sorry. Um, the, I guess it just, just occurs to me that. Got to stand up and say your name and title. <laughs> I don't have a title. <laughs> the, uh, there's an assumption in a lot of this discussion that uh, it's going to take time, we need to redo really this, that, and the other thing. The assumption that under the underlying that is that you have time. And one of the things I would just remind people is that the, the uh, Springfield's. Uh, snuck up on you totally, and it all happened very fast. Ernest Hemingway wrote in a novel once that bankruptcy, bankruptcy comes on slowly and then very fast. And so your assumption, so, so the idea that well, we, we just, we'll decide to take time, we could decide to take time, but it's not at all clear that you've got time. We're, we're thinking about it. You don't have any, there's no provision in any of this for triggers. In other words, how far do you, you've got, you've got six hospitals that are in trouble, you've got, so you have no, you have no metric, okay, which says, okay, how, is, it, is it a given hospital? Is it, is it three months out? Is it six days out? Is it six months out? Is it two years out? And if you have no trigger, then, the, then, the, then you have no, you have no real ability to react. Thank you. Thank you, Hamilton. Anyone else? Seeing none, I wish to uh, thank you. And at this point, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.